Hello everyone, bringing you a video today looking at these two sets of load carrying equipment or web equipment. On my right, your left, we have of course the US M1956 equipment and on my left, your right, we have the British 1958 pattern equipment. Little caveat starting out here, for the majority of this we're going to be looking at the two sets of equipment uh, in fighting order or the fighting load, uh, depending on the terminology used. Um, we'll probably look at the, the pack and the sleeping gear carrier separately at some point. This isn't completely, uh, it doesn't include all elements of the two sets. Basically what we're going to be looking at is what we have on the mannequins here, with a little bit of extra bits and pieces thrown in, but we'll get to that during the video. Another little thing I'll run over just before we start and um, we get into the uh, main part of the video, I'll just talk briefly about the two uniforms. On my right, your left, we have a US M951 field jacket and this is badged up to the 1st Cavalry Division, a specialist for uh, in the 1st Cavalry Division. The era we're looking at is around 1960 here with both sets of equipment very much in there, pretty much as issued, as first issued uh, configuration. Uh, so as I say, a specialist for 1st uh, Cavalry Division in Korea. This is before the 1st Cavalry Air Mobile, before the reflagging which took place uh, in the mid 60s when of course the 1st Cav in Korea would become the 2nd Infantry, Infantry Division. Um, so it's before that took place that we're looking at. Uh, and that's the uniform here, the US combat uniform of this period. The British combat uniform of this period, the 1960 pattern was only just beginning to go into production or about to go into production at this time period. So the combat smock here is of a Korean War uh, manufacture, Korean War era manufacture, so 50s. And these were on issue to troops in the field at the time. You do see them in the early 60s. These were being worn before uh, or alongside the earliest issues of 1960 pattern combat uniform. So that's a little bit about the uniforms just to introduce them as it were. Onto the web equipment now, onto the load carrying equipment. What I'm going to do is there's going to be two parts to this. This first part will be looking at the equipment on the mannequin and going basically running through a, a um, a, a basic comparison of the two sets of equipment. Um, we won't be uh, sort of looking at um, uh, details. We'll get to that in a separate video where I'll look at the individual components together. The reason they're interesting to contrast these two sets of equipment, they are to a degree at least intended to fulfill a, a similar role. Uh, they're, designed with a, they're designed with a similar idea of the future battlefield in mind. And that is to say, uh, that's a battlefield uh, where you're gonna have armored personnel carriers um, and there was an increasing view that armoured personnel carriers would be very necessary, infantry would have to be armoured uh, on a, a battlefield where tactical nuclear weapons could be used. There was some idea that infantry were going to have to be armoured in order to fight on a modern battlefield and this, these two sets of equipment were definitely designed with a view to the European battlefield from that point of view. We'll talk a little bit about the M1956 first. Um, the Americans of course beat into the punch in terms of getting this modern web equipment uh, out in green with darkened fittings and so forth, and a thoroughly modern design for the 1950s. The M1956, there's perhaps a reason for that in that it was perhaps needed more. Uh, although the British were introduced, uh, or had introduced by the, the 60s, the uh, L1A1 self-loading rifle, the web equipment that pre-existed was fine. It would take the magazines no problem. The US are looking to introduce the M14, and aside from the BAR belt, the standard cartridge belt, obviously for the M1 Garand, will not carry uh, M14 magazines, so perhaps it's perhaps arguable that they had a little bit more impetus to get this equipment into service because the universal uh, ammunition cases, the ammunition pouches were more needed in US service because of the new weapon being introduced. So we'll talk about those first. The universal ammunition cases, obviously you can see here, they will take on block clips for the M1 Garand, they will take grenades, they will take M14 magazines, they're very much universal in that regard. Um, they differ a little bit from the British design in that obviously they're quite shallow. Uh, the British, of course, needed to accommodate magazines for the Bren, the L4, as was the 7.62 conversion of the Bren, the L4 light machine gun, the LMG. The magazines had to fit in the pouches as well, so obviously they are made deeper for that purpose to take the 30 round magazines. Uh, these are also um, supported separately from the actual um, suspenders. Uh, in American terminology, you obviously have the, the extra strap here, which loops up to the D-ring on the front, whereas in British uh, in British service of the pouch of the 1958 pattern are directly supported by the, the straps on the front of the yoke. Now this is set up um, as per a diagram I've seen of early 
uh, an early diagram of fitting instructions, I suppose, in British terminology of how to wear the M9056 equipment. Haven't really seen it done this way in the field. Normally you see the brace straps come down behind the ammunition pouches, the ammunition cases. But as I say, I've taken this off the drawing so it's done as per the manual. Um, and you actually end up with multiple points of support around the belt, a little bit like the earlier 1944 and 1945 suspenders um, when worn in this manner. And it does work quite well, but you don't see it done in the field very often. I would say, I'm not really in this video intending to draw um, any conclusion as to which equipment set is better. Um, I'm, I would merely say that I think the system of supporting the pouch directly, as here on the 1958 pattern, is perhaps superior. Um, and the US, of course, would end up with this, with the Linklo and then the Alice equipment systems, where you have a, an eyelet on the back and the hook on the front of the suspender simply supports the weight of the pouch when they're worn. So given the US came round to that, uh, design in the end, I think it's fair to say that that's superior to having the separate straps. There's only one real advantage to this that I can see, uh, and that is because the pouches are mounted slightly high on the belt and have a tendency to sag forward if not supported. If you're wearing more than one, you can clip multiple up to whichever side you're wearing more than one on. There's an option there if you happen to be wearing more than one ammunition case on one side or the other. So, uh, obviously the suspenders themselves, comparing to British, uh, comparing the two, um, the suspenders obviously hook onto the belt using eyelets. The, the British uh, yoke comes down and loops through the, the D-rings on the back of the pouches to support there. And obviously the, the British design a little bit more a little bit easier to uh, actually um, adjust whilst wearing the equipment. You can just pull down on the straps. This can, you can adjust the M9056 whilst you're wearing it by pulling the, the lock up on the buckle and sliding them and everything, but it's not quite as easy. Um, but obviously this is this goes back to the previous US equipment sets where the belts are, are supported uh, using hooks and it's a little bit more adapt adaptable in that regard. Obviously you can wear this supported with the suspenders with no pouches attached at all. Whereas with the 1958 pattern you have to have the pouches or brace attachments on the belt in order to actually pass the straps of the yoke through. So the M9056 is a little bit more adaptable in that regard. Um, the belt itself, uh, interestingly, of course, the 1958 pattern draws a little bit from US practice, but the M9056 is also a little bit more akin to British design in that the belt can be adjusted on both sides. So the belt loops back on itself and can be adjusted back on each side, which gives you a bit more uh, room for adjustment in comparison to the M9056 pistol belt, which of course adjusts on one side only and the buckle is fixed on the other side. So that's a little bit more akin to British practice. The 1958 pattern belt, of course, adjusts basically in the same manner with hooks and eyes down eyelets down the front down the center line of the belt as opposed to previous and subsequent designs where you'd actually use hooks and little pockets on the back akin to 1937 pattern and the other British designs that use that method of adjusting the belt. The buckles differ obviously the 1919 designed Mills hook and loop buckle there and the little locket buckle on the US belt they both work fine um, I think you get a little bit more rigidity from the British buckle, whereas this is obviously is it can rotate, the, the um, loop can rotate around the locket, but they both work fine, so there's not really any uh, conclusion to draw there over, over which is better. And a feature of the design on the front here, which you'll, is not, there's nothing analogous on the British uh, set of equipment, is the Compass First Aid pouch. Um, in terms of using it as a dressing pouch, the British were still issuing combat uniforms which had a, a leg pocket and so there was no need for this to be included, although interestingly later on a dressing pocket would uh, apparently appear for the 1958 pattern and there are different um, accounts of different designs of dressing pocket used with the equipment, also very common to tape shell dressings onto the equipment and so forth. So perhaps a feature that was lacking from the, the equipment, uh, depending on um, your opinion on that, uh, different design ethos, basically different ideas regarding design and where the dressing would be carried, meant that the British equipment didn't at its inception have a dressing uh, pocket and it's not something that's really appeared on British equipment since the uniforms are made with a specific pocket to take a field dressing so that's the difference in, in design thinking there uh, and obviously this in US use is something that's endured but we'll have a look at a bit a bit more of a look at these in detail as I say in the second part of this we'll look at the actual design features of each element um, and, uh, and run over that in comparison between the two sets where possible where there are um, direct uh, comparisons that can be uh, explored. So that's the front of the equipment. We'll move these round now and we'll have a look at the, the sides and the back of the equipment and the various items that are carried there. Okay, here we have the right-hand side of the equipment set. We'll start with the M1956. Again, 
first into production, so it's as good a reason as any. And we have here the classic US canteen cover uh, on, the, on the right hip here. Now, this design basically uh, is a little changed from the M1910 and would go on to obviously be adapted for the Lelinklo and the Alice system through M1967. So the basic design with the two flaps that come down around the sides and fasten at the front is endured right the way through to the modern day, essentially. And there's nothing wrong with it. Um, this differs from Second World War examples, obviously that preceded it in having snaps here and here rather than the lifted off, lifted off fasteners. And obviously on the back, as with most components of M1956, it has slide keepers. So it's deleted the hanger hooks used on uh, earlier equipment. Uh, obviously we still have in here the venerable M1910 metal canteen. The plastic canteen would come into use during the 60s, but in this early 60s era, you'd still have the metal, bottle, metal bottles being used. So we've included that there as well canteens, excuse me, using the British terminology. You can also see the side of the field pack there, but we'll get on to talk a little bit more about that once we move the mannequin around. In terms of British equipment here, uh, the 1958 pattern, we don't have a bottle on this side. And the reason for this is that when introduced, the British equipment didn't actually come with the 1958 pattern water bottle that everyone knows today. Um, there had been some wrangling regarding what would be issued. And there was initially an idea that the the rear kidney pouches here would contain uh, the old enamel felt covered water bottle. Uh, there was also a trials bottle that fitted in one of these, a square bottle that fitted in the back here. But this was not a great design uh, feature for several reasons. One is you lose a lot of capacity in the back here. That's a major problem. And also it's very inaccessible compared to something round on the hip that you can get at. Um, so why that was being mooted, I don't know. But as designed, the British equipment doesn't have a water bottle with it. So we haven't included that here. Of course, some men would use the 1944 pattern, which is essentially, a, I would say, improved M1910 with the wider neck and so forth. Uh, whether you consider the 44 pattern better than the M1910, it's up to you. Uh, some men would use those. But as if by magic, we have here what would appear in 1962, the water bottle in its pouch, which of course would sit roughly there on the hip. Uh, however, I'm not going to talk about this in great detail in this video because it isn't part of the initial issue and therefore that is a failing of the 1958 pattern. When introduced it didn't actually have its water bottle and carrier with it and this is the carrier and everything for this is inferior to the M1956 anyway. I would also argue the bottle and cup is as well because the cup isn't made of metal um, and that uh, isn't great you know for the point of view of heating over, uh, over a stove or something like that that's a bit of a problem. Uh, Again, whether you view that as a problem or not, uh, entirely up to you. The plastic cup has advantages because you don't burn your lips on it when you drink from it. It's better to drink hot beverages from than a metal cup. However, you can't heat it over a fire. But we'll talk about this in more detail in the next video when we look at various components in direct comparison because I will include it there to compare to the M1956. So the, uh, the water bottle in its pouch there. Before we move on from looking at the right hand side of the equipment, you can see a side profile here of one of the kidney pouches. Uh, again, we'll have a direct comparison between those and the field pack when we look at the back of the mannequin in just a moment. Okay, here we have the backs of the two equipment sets and you can see here, again looking at the M1956 first, we have the field pack or butt pack as it would come to be known for obvious reasons. Now this, uh, it's been said, uh, it's been discussed, this had a, a really limited capacity in terms of carrying kit. Uh, it's really designed for say a sea ration, a sea ration meal, wash kit, socks, that's basically what you're going to get in here. So very much a fighting load. It's not going to keep you going in the field very long. Ditto for the uh, kidney pouches of the, the uh, M1958 pattern equipment. These will really only carry a very small subsistence load, though their capacity is a little bit greater than that of the field pack. So they get points for that. There's a little bit better capacity in here. You can store a mess tin in each and within that you can store other kits and, and rations and so forth. So a little bit greater carrying capacity with the, M90, uh, the M1958, the 1958 pattern equipment. Uh, the field pack, however, does have an advantage. And I was talking about this with the ammunition pouches before. This is directly supported by the brace, uh, by the um, suspenders. Uh, and you can see here the hooks when it's worn on the belt, rather than these hooking onto the belt, they hook directly onto the field pack, which means the top of it is fully support supported and it doesn't sag away from the body. The same cannot be said for the kidney pouches, at least not in this uh, issue, in this first issue of them. You can see they, if I lift this one up here, it should really sit something like that and it sags away from the body under its own weight because there's very little supporting it. They sit quite high on the belt, there's very little supporting it at the top here. Later this would be somewhat rectified by an extra loop at the top, uh, a tab 
that could be inserted or pulled out, which would actually hold this up against the vertical strap on the back of the yoke. That hadn't been introduced at this point. It wasn't until around 1965 that that would uh, become part of the design. So that's a failing, really. It's not very comfortable when they're bouncing around and sagging onto the, the back of the hips. They're uh, not the most comfortable. Um, as I say, the direct support of the field pack is, is better, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to that. However, there is one feature of these that will be lost, obviously, if they were clipped into the system like this, and that they, these are actually on a quick release tab. So you can pull a tab out of the back and these will come away from the back of the belt. And we'll look at that feature when we look at these in more detail. Whether that's a particularly useful feature or not, I can't really say. I don't know whether it was really used in the field, but that seems to be part of the design and that's one reason that they aren't um, uh, supported at the top here. And when they were, it was with another quick release tab so they could still be removed from the back of the equipment. Some features on here, which obviously the US kit doesn't have, uh, you've got the poncho roll here, which is worn empty. And that's because it also provides a stabilizing strap for the shovel, which is carried on the back here. This basically does the job of the straps on the bottom of the field pack here, which could also carry a rolled poncho. They're currently tucked out of the way. We'll look at that when we look at the equipment in more detail. Uh, this also serves as a carrier for the head for the lightweight pick. So again, it's a multi-purpose piece of web equipment. There is a reason for having a whole carrier as opposed to just a set of straps underneath the kidney pouches, let's say. Um, so it does. It serves to stabilize the shovel and it will also carry the head as well as carrying of the uh, pick, as well as carrying the poncho. Later, of course, it would be used to carry MBC kit, but that's not really at this pit, the period we're looking at here. Something we'll have to talk about now and then compare to a feature of the US equipment when we move it around again is the lightweight shovel. This, of course, replaces any sort of folding or two-part entrenching tool in the system. And from my personal experience, I'd prefer to have a, sh a small, proper shovel than any folding design uh, because it's sturdier and easy to use. So I think this is a good piece of the design. Of course, when the problem with this fitment here, this, this way of attaching it onto the webbing is if you wear something, a Bergen on the back, uh, this will dig into your back. And this was often removed later on for wearing Bergens on the back. The shovel, of course, if you were wearing the pack, could be moved onto the back of the pack so that you're not wearing anything over this and driving it into the back. When you wear the pack, the shovel will be taken off and affixed to the back of the pack instead, or Bergen or whatever. Um, this, as I say, later on, when you needed greater carrying capacity and men would start wearing Bergens with the equipment, this would become a problem. But uh, in terms of carrying the shovel here, it throws most of the weight onto the padded area of the yoke, which is good. And it is a proper little shovel. It's not just a, a folding, it's not a folding entrenching tool. Much as they are, the US design of folding entrenching tool is good. I'd still prefer to have a, a lightweight shovel. Uh, and that, as I say, is the British answer to the question of carrying entrenching tools is the lightweight pick and shovel rather than a, a purpose designed, uh, well, they are purpose designed, but rather than a folding um, entrenching tool that's a little bit more compact. So uh, that's the back of the two equipment sets. We'll move on now to look at the uh, left-hand side. Here we have the left-hand side of the two equipment sets, and we can hear, see here on the M1956 equipment, the entrenching tool, essentially a design introduced during the Second World War. This is an updated version, the M1951, which has a pick, a folding pick, uh, head as well as the folding shovel. We'll look at that when we look at the equipment in more detail. Uh, and the cover is M1956, essentially updated from the Second World War examples. So you have a snap in place of the uh, lift the dot fastener and obviously it's attached to the belt with slide keepers rather than using the hanger hooks movable or fixed on the back as previous designs had. Um, it does have hanger hook attachments here and this is for a bayonet sheath or scabbard which can be worn across. A good place to have it because it's easy to draw from there and having the two items together also means that any the items that do hang down below the belt are kept in one kept together in one place uh, so you don't have multiple items hanging down around the the side of the belt um, it does seem a little bit odd that in a, in a set of equipment designed to minimize that and minimize items hanging down below the belt that there isn't provision to carry this on the back now i understand the handle would probably interfere with the field pack but i'm sure that could have been overcome uh, it just seems odd when you've got nothing here to not have a way of carrying the entrenching tool up on the back. Obviously, with earlier systems, the pack systems the US had used prior to this and the hanger hooks on the back of the uh, carrier, eyelets have been provided so you could actually carry the entrenching tool on the back of the pack, which is commonly seen in Korea in the latter days of the Second World War. So uh, just a slight, um, a slight issue I have with the design as far as that's concerned. When the entrenching tool is carried down on the belt like this, 
it's not ideal in my opinion and I think there could have been a way of, of getting around this uh, but there anyway that's the entrenching tool nothing like that on the British system here but a similar approach to avoiding the bayonet um, hanging down and getting in the way and that the bayonet is attached to another piece of equipment obviously with the US equipment here if you weren't wearing the entrenching tool the bayonet would hang down from hanger hooks below the belt uh, on the British system the uh, side of the ammunition pouch has loops to take the bayonet uh, and this is obviously means that it's held up out of the way and it's not loose dangling around down below and this is inherited from the 1944 pattern equipment which had preceded this um, you have here straps coming from the poncho carrier to stabilize that and prevent that from fl flapping around uh, they also pull the ammunition pouches back a little bit and we can more clearly see from the side view here the ammunition pouches on the 1958 pattern do hang down considerably lower being longer to take the L4 magazines, they hang down considerably lower than the US, uh, their US counterparts, which sit quite high on the belt. Um, but they are stabilized by this strap and it's also necessary for this strap to be there to pull them away a little bit from the hips to allow men to sit down. This was a problem with both the first and second issue of these because they hang straight on the belt. In the mid, mid to late 1960s, a new design would be introduced which hang at an angle which makes it easier to sit down. Obviously important when this equipment is designed for, essentially uh, with armoured infantry in mind and you're going to be sat down a lot of the time. So uh, that's the left-hand side of the two equipment sets. So there we are, that's a look at these two sets of web equipment or load carrying equipment, depending on nomenclature. Uh, I, as I say, quite interesting, the two different design uh, school, schools of thought regarding the design of the equipment and the various features. As I say, the similarities are also interesting. Um, and obviously that's not surprising considering these two sets of equipment were designed to basically do the same job. As I say, going forward, I'm going to do a part two where we'll look at the various components you've seen here on the mannequins in more detail. And I will probably at some point in the future do a part three considering the pack and the sleeping gear carrier respectively. I won't be going into sort of the pack adapter and so forth, the M1956, but not in this series anyway. Quite apart from anything, I don't have one. They weren't used very, very much uh, and also as I say, it goes beyond the remit of the basic equipment, really, um, in terms of, of actual use, mainly because it wasn't used very much. Uh, as I say, it's, it's not really the, a, a major part of the design thinking of the equipment. It's very much an afterthought, uh, a little bit as the sleeping gear carrier and the pack were as well, judging by the way they were designed to attach. So, um, as I say, that's uh, basically what, uh, what I wanted to cover in the video. I do hope you find it, found it interesting, as I always say. Uh, if you have and you'd like to see more, then obviously part two is coming up. Please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. Uh, and obviously if you're new to subscribing or already subscribed, do make sure you've clicked the little notification button, the little bell down there. Otherwise you won't be alerted when I upload future videos. Um, as always, I'll plug my Facebook and Instagram page, which are, there are links to in both of those in the description. Uh, this is a good place to keep up with what's going on with the channel, also reenacting events and so forth. I post a lot of photographs and things up there. Um, so a good place to uh, keep up with what's going on as well as uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel. Uh, but I think that's everything I wanted to cover in the video today. So until next time, bye for now. I think this has sunk down again. You just, just stay. Stay at the right height.